What if Quinlan Boss trained Anakin Skywalker? That is our story for today, and let's get right into it. Our story begins on Tatooine, as many of the wealthiest citizens from around the planet have gathered to watch the Boonta Eve classic pod race. Everyone was here to bet on and watch their favorite racer, Sebulba, but something was happening that had never happened before. A young human boy, a slave named Anakin Skywalker, had entered the race and was near the front as the final lap was finishing up. In attendance, Qui-Gon Jinn, Anakin's mother, Padme Amidala, and Jar Jar Binks anxiously watched. But further into the stands, another Jedi watched curiously. Jedi Master Quinlan Vos was looking on, wondering who this boy was. Quinlan was on an undercover mission on Tatooine that took him to this pod race, and he watched with even more curiosity as the boy won. The pop of the crowd was huge, as everyone celebrated Anakin Skywalker. Quinlan then watched Qui-Gon Jinn hurry over to Anakin, lifting him up on his shoulders, and Quinlan decided to make his way through the crowd, getting down to the racers, and finding Qui-Gon as everyone else was departing. Boss spoke up, asking Qui-Gon who the boy was, and Qui-Gon was actually surprised to see him, but absolutely welcomed Quinlan's presence. Quinlan and Qui-Gon were very different, but opposites tend to attract, and so the two had some interesting conversations in the temple through the years. Qui-Gon told Quinlan what he suspects, that this boy is strong in the Force, and could be the prophesied chosen one, so he will be bringing him back to the temple. Quinlan thought this to be very interesting, and he thanked Qui-Gon, wishing him luck on the rest of his mission. Quinlan was intrigued to know more, but he had his own mission to continue at least for now. He felt that, in time, he would see the boy again. A few days later, Quinlan Vos would return to the Jedi Temple for the first time in months. The temple was quiet, and he seemingly returned around the same time as the Jedi Council from Naboo. He wondered what had happened, but as he moved towards his quarters, he was stopped by a young Jedi that Quinlan knew to be Obi-Wan Kenobi, Padawan of Qui-Gon. Obi-Wan asked to speak with Quinlan, and so the two began talking. Quinlan learned that Qui-Gon died on Naboo, and he was very saddened to hear this. But Obi-Wan quickly changed the subject, saying that he is trying to let go of him, and he said that Anakin needs to be trained. Quinlan listened carefully, as Obi-Wan asked Quinlan to train Anakin. Obi-Wan knew that he and Qui-Gon spoke on Tatooine, and Obi-Wan acknowledged that he was not ready for a Padawan. He promised Qui-Gon that Anakin would be trained, but he did not have to be the one to do it. Quinlan thought this over, as he just saw his previous Padawan, Ayla Sakura, become a knight. Was he already ready for another Padawan? Quinlan said that for now he would like to just spend time with Anakin, and he would speak to Yoda about all of this when he knows the answer of whether or not he wants to train him. Obi-Wan thanked Quinlan, and they went their separate ways, as Quinlan went to see Anakin. Upon finding him, Quinlan quickly realized he was very fond of this boy. Anakin was extremely reserved and quiet, as he just lost his mother, and then Qui-Gon, but Quinlan could sense a beaming personality underneath Anakin's hard exterior, and this reminded Quinlan of himself. When he was young, Quinlan lost both of his parents, and had to cope with this before officially joining the Jedi Order and Quinlan decided he wanted to guide Anakin in this same way. He could help Anakin become himself, and in time, a powerful Jedi. So Quinlan would speak to Yoda about this, and was able to convince Yoda to allow it. Yoda and the Council were worried that Anakin would have been trouble adapting to a new life in the temple, but if anyone could make Anakin feel at home, it was Quinlan, so he would be Anakin's Jedi Master. The first few days with the two of them were rather interesting, as Quinlan really just tried to talk to Anakin, make him feel comfortable, and have Anakin express to Quinlan what he wanted as his life as a Jedi. Quinlan found Anakin to be quite unique, as at just 10 years old, he seemed to know exactly what he wanted, to help people. From Anakin's point of view, the Jedi were meant to help those in need, and Quinlan agreed. He wasn't one to spend too much time in the temple, instead, he spent most of his time helping the police in the lower levels of Coruscant, and this did intrigue Anakin. He grew up on Tatooine, surrounded by some of the worst beings in the galaxy. So strangely enough, his comfort zone was actually to be underneath Coruscant, not in the Great Temple all the time. Quinlan quickly learned that this would be a successful partnership. The next few years would fly by, as Quinlan would learn that Anakin was not suited for traditional Jedi training. He was better at learning by example, 
and within a year, Anakin was running with Quinlan through the Coruscant Undercity streets, keeping up with him for the most part. Sure, Quinlan would sometimes have to slow down, or use the Force to help Anakin with a huge jump, but at just 14 years old now, Anakin was known around the levels of Coruscant as a hero to those in need. He was just a boy, but the people loved him. Quinlan was the official liaison with the local law enforcement. He was given this role by the Jedi Order, and he would often share intel at known cop cantinas. Law enforcement greatly enjoyed his help, and he enjoyed working with the law enforcement. It was a great partnership. And in one instance, Quinlan was tracking down a Rodian that was assassinating law enforcement. He was an excellent tracker, and he was teaching Anakin some of his methods. Though Anakin would never be quite as good, Quinlan had psychometric powers which made him an extra great tracker. Anakin was jealous of this, and this jealousy made him work extra hard to be a great tracker without that power. As they tracked the Rodian, they came upon a corner where a Mandalorian was standing above the dead Rodian. He turned, saying that Quinlan was not the only one hired for the job, then blasted off with his jetpack. Quinlan chuckled to Anakin, saying that it was going to happen quite often down here. And for the next few years from here, the two Jedi would get super close with each other. Quinlan was known around the Order as a bit of a maverick who definitely didn't always follow the ways of the Jedi. And this, of course, rubbed off a lot on Anakin. Anakin was never suited for the traditional Jedi life, and he quite enjoyed working with Quinlan on undercover missions or whatever else. As Quinlan and Anakin got more powerful with each other, and also more famous in the Coruscant underworld, both the Jedi and the Sith took notice to it. To the Jedi, there were many debates inside the Council about reining Anakin in, making him more of a regular Jedi. But others thought this could be unwise. Since the day Anakin arrived, everyone knew he was different, and it was eventually decided that it would be a bad idea to try to fit a square peg into a round hole, per se. Meanwhile, the Sith had plans regarding them both. Quinlan was no stranger to the dark side, though he swore to never really use it, he was simply familiar with it. And the Sith planned to exploit this, and in turn, bring Anakin to their side. All in due time, they thought. And soon enough, the Clone Wars would begin. Voss and Skywalker would embrace the Clone Wars at the start, as both of them enjoyed the action. They had to leave the Coruscant Underworld for now, but together the two of them would be the leaders in many different battles on Cato Nemoidia, Volusia, Kashyyyk, and others. The two of them were a solid duo, but they were very unorthodox, and therefore they were assigned a very strict, by the book, clone commander named Phi. They balanced each other well, but eventually the two of them were sent on a mission without the clones, with another Jedi Master. His name? Obi-Wan Kenobi. On the landing platform, Quinlan greeted Obi-Wan warmly, and the two shook hands. Obi-Wan greeted Anakin, and Anakin remembered him from his first days as a Jedi. Sure, he'd seen Obi-Wan around, but the two hadn't really talked. To Obi-Wan, Anakin reminded him of Qui-Gon, and he was finally able to just be with Anakin and spend time with him. Anakin almost didn't recognize him with the beard, and Obi-Wan sarcastically said that he couldn't wait to work with two versions of the Maverick Quinlan. Together, they traveled to Nalhutta, trying to figure out who broke Zero the Hut out of prison, and throughout the mission, Anakin and Obi-Wan couldn't really stop bickering. It was like every time one of them had an idea, the other wanted to do the opposite. The mission would go on for a few days, and it would end with the death of Zero. But in the end, the three Jedi would say goodbye and go on their own. Once Kenobi left, Quinlan apologized, saying they won't have to work with Kenobi again. But Anakin was confused, saying that he got along quite well with Obi-Wan. Quinlan chuckled, wondering how that could be possible with all the bickering, but he didn't question it anymore. The war would go on, and eventually Quinlan and Anakin began to really get discouraged with it all. Neither side seemed to be winning, and no end was in sight. More people were unnecessarily dying every single day, and the two of them were frustrated with how much the Council was tied into the Republic, unable to do what was necessary. The Sith, most notably Darth Sidious, really began to notice this, and so he put together a plan. In a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Anakin, Palpatine said that Dooku was returning to Sereno, and he wondered why the Jedi Council was so opposed to taking the fight to Sereno. He told Anakin that perhaps, if the Jedi were more willing to do what was necessary, they would find a way to get to Dooku. Palpatine knew where this would lead. Though Skywalker and Boss were overall good for each other, 
they also fed into each other's bad ideas. So when Skywalker, almost jokingly, said they should just go to Sereno and assassinate Dooku, Quinlan said that perhaps it was a good idea. This actually took Anakin by surprise, but they quickly got into serious discussions about it. They'd gone undercover countless times before, and within a few days, they had an idea. The two of them intercepted a supply ship headed for Sereno, and, with fake clearance codes, were able to take the ship to the planet's capital city. Within hours, they'd snuck off into the forest neighboring Dooku's castle, waiting for nightfall. When the wait was finally over, and the moonlight shone against the castle as the lights turned off inside, the two of them snuck on the outer edge of the castle. When underneath the window ledge, Quinlan lifted Anakin with the Force, who then lifted Quinlan up. There were security droids surrounding every inch of the castle, so the two Jedi had to be extremely careful. If there was anyone else with them, the secret mission would have been nearly impossible. But once safely on the window ledge, the two of them only had a split second to act before security forces would find them. So at once, they cut through the main window, diving straight for Dooku's room. They landed on the floor, but the bed was empty. Instead, from all around the room, ten of Dooku's personal Magna Guards emerged from the dark, their yellow staffs lighting up. Skywalker and Voss quickly realized that they were trapped, as a hologram of Dooku appeared behind them, welcoming them to Sereno. Dooku encouraged them to surrender, or their lives would end here. But the two Jedi instead ignited their lightsabers, looking to the oncoming droids. Dooku said, unfortunate, and his hologram disappeared. The Magna Guards moved in, coordinating their attacks with great mechanical precision. Anakin and Quinlan seamlessly complemented each other well, a well-practiced duo through their years of experience. Sparks flew as lightsabers clashed against the electrified weapons, creating a display of lights in the darkened corridors. Anakin's frustration fueled as he was walking into this trap, and it fueled his aggression, his determination evident in every swing, every parry against the droids. Anakin and Quimlin would disarm the Magna Guards one by one, the electrified staffs clattering to the floor, as they were not really a match for the Jedi. The two of them used the Force to throw the final two guards out of the window, now breathing heavily. It was time to go. Dooku was not here. But as the two of them moved back to the window to leave, three vulture droids swooped down, blasting missiles into the open room. Quinlan used the Force to pull the missiles away from Anakin, yelling, Get out of here! as the missiles crashed into the floor near Quinlan. The building began to explode. Anakin was thrown backwards. He tried to get up and go find Quinlan, but the fire from the explosion hit him, sending him flying into the trees, crashing to the ground. He went in and out of consciousness, but when he finally awoke for good, he could feel his right arm was broken, along with his left ankle. Dooku's ship landed outside of the destroyed castle, and Anakin watched as he and countless droids scoured the area. He knew he had to go before the droids could get him, so Anakin wiped away tears for his master and left, eventually making it into town, taking a public transport back to Coruscant. Once finally back in the temple, Anakin was extremely weak and was brought into the medical facility. After a few days of being knocked out from exhaustion and his injuries, Anakin woke up and was brought into the Jedi Council chambers to report exactly where he was, and Anakin told the whole truth, as he had no reason to lie. It was his idea to go after Dooku, and because of it, he lost his master. He felt numb, and when the council heard the report, Windu shook his head in a disappointed way, and Yoda assigned Anakin to archive duty indefinitely. His actions, along with those of Master Voss, resulted in the death of a Jedi, so Anakin must learn his lesson over time. For the next six months, Anakin would work with Madame Jocasta New in the archives. Part of him wanted to protest against this, but how could he? He failed, and maybe it was best that he was taken out of the battlefield. And over these months, Anakin would still learn of the war and what was going on, and was often visited by his now very good friend, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Kenobi would come to Anakin, saying that he could relate to seeing his master die, and the two would share conversations that helped Anakin come back to himself. Eventually, Obi-Wan would mention that there was a new Sith assassin on the loose, similar to Ventress, and they were not easy to deal with. This was rather interesting, but not something that Anakin could do anything about, unfortunately. As more time would pass, Anakin would allow himself to think back to the incident, 
wondering how it all went so wrong, wondering how Dooku knew they were coming. None of it made sense. They told no one. But soon, after so many months of thinking, something clicked for Anakin. The reason he knew Dooku was on Sereno to begin with. Palpatine. He told Anakin that Dooku was on Sereno. Could Palpatine be in on all of this? Another month would go by with Anakin pondering this idea, when eventually he decided to just pursue this thought. So one late night, when everyone in the temple was asleep and Chancellor Palpatine had left his office, Anakin snuck into Palpatine's office, using force tricks to make sure nobody saw him enter. Once inside, Anakin spent hours looking for anything, any sort of clue that could lead to Palpatine's involvement with Dooku, with the Separatists, anything. But after a night of searching, he found nothing. There were some strange artifacts, sure, and they seemed to be hollow, but Anakin couldn't seem to see if anything was inside without actually destroying them and showing that he was here, so he gave up on all that. When morning came around, Anakin was back in the temple, and he decided to continue his search. He informed Jocasta Nu that he felt sick, so he went to his quarters, then snuck out of the temple and went to 500 Republica, the building where Palpatine's apartment resided. He had to sneak past a group of royal guards, but once inside, Anakin searched high and low, looking for anything. But again, nothing. After hours, Anakin planned to leave when he noticed a statue, just like the one in Palpatine's office. Anakin approached it, picking it up to reveal a hidden lever. Behind it all, Anakin pulled the lever, and suddenly one of the walls shifted to reveal a hidden elevator. Finally, Anakin had something. He quickly took the elevator down, and it traveled for what seemed like forever, finally reaching the ground, which was an extremely long tunnel, heading into the direction of the industrial sector. This was very strange, Anakin thought, and so he began running through the tunnels. In his office, Chancellor Palpatine watched all of this happen. He, of course, had secret cameras set up in his apartment, and although Anakin finding the tunnel to his secret lair in the industrial sector was not ideal, Palpatine decided that he could use this to his advantage, and so he contacted the Sith Assassin. Anakin ran for so long, sprinting through the long, dark tunnel, until finally he came upon a door and another elevator. Anakin used the force to slide the door open, and inside, he saw something he truly did not expect. Geonosians and battle droids, all working on data tables for what seemed to be separatist operations, and it was all right underneath the Republic. Anakin prepared to move inside, but before he could, a red lightsaber ignited behind him. Though it was dark, Anakin saw the assassin behind him wearing a mask. He had long hair under the mask, and he wore dark robes. Anakin reached for his own lightsaber, but was force-pushed into the room, slamming into the data machines. The Separatists scrambled away as Anakin got back up, igniting his lightsaber just in time to engage this Sith. The clash of lightsabers quickly reverberated through the confined space, creating sparks as the two fighters pushed back into the hallway. Anakin's blue saber clashed with the crimson blade of the assassin, each strike resonating with the power of the force. The assassin moved with acrobatic grace, utilizing the dark side to enhance their agility and speed. Anakin met each strike with great skill. Pipes on the walls erupted as the blades collided, casting eerie shadows dancing along the cold walls. The tunnel's length seemed to stretch into eternity. As the combatants pressed forward, neither willing to yield, Anakin's eyes blazed with intensity, while the assassin maintained a calm demeanor beneath the mask. The air crackled with the energy of their duel, each strike very decisive, and finally Anakin flipped over the assassin, cutting through the mask, landing behind them. As Anakin moved in for the kill, the assassin turned, and Anakin had to stop in his tracks. The eyes looking back at him were those of his former master, Quinlan Vos. On Sereno, the day Anakin left Quinlan behind, Dooku found him still alive in the rubble. Quinlan had woken up days later, imprisoned in a sort of electric ray shield, with Dooku in front of him. From here, Dooku and Sidious would go on to torture Voss, bringing him to the brink of death time and time again. But Voss swore to himself that he would stay alive. But unfortunately, the only way for him to stay alive was to embrace the dark side. And so he did. But in doing so, he gave his mind over to the Lords of the Sith. Sidious would go on to infect his mind 
with twisted visions of the future, showing him visions of the Jedi, trying to take over the Republic, showing him that only through the Sith can true peace be achieved. After six months of this, Quinlan was brainwashed. He was then given a mask of the Sith, infected by the dark side, a mask that could control Quinlan while he was wearing it. He went on to fight for the Separatists, until this very moment. When Anakin cut through the mask, Quinlan was freed from the darkness that filled his mind, and he fell down to his knees, screaming out in agony over what he had done, looking up at his former student. Quinlan said he couldn't stop himself, that in order to stay alive, he had to embrace the dark, and the Sith had taken over. Anakin hesitated, but soon helped Quinlan up, and Quinlan said that he could still redeem himself. Sidious and Dooku would be meeting in the lair above them. Quinlan said that he was supposed to bring Anakin to the dark side today, but instead, together, they can defeat the Sith. Anakin was extremely taken aback by all of this, but above all, he was relieved to have saved his master. And now, they boarded the elevator up to the lair. Together, Dooku and Sidious waited for Quinlan and Anakin to arrive. Either Quinlan will have converted Anakin to the dark side, or they will be coming here to die as Jedi. Anakin disrupted plans by investigating Palpatine, but everything would end, one way or another, here today. Soon enough, the elevator door opened, and two lightsabers ignited. Dooku stepped to Sidious' side, and Sidious said, So be it, Jedi, before they, too, ignited their sabers. Now in the heart of the industrial sector of Coruscant, within the foreboding Sith lair, Anakin and Quinlan found themselves locked in a confrontation against the Dark Lords of the Sith, Count Dooku and Darth Sidious. The Sith decided the Jedi would have to die here today before they could continue these plans, as these two Jedi were very dangerous to them. And the Sith lair now echoed with the hum of lightsabers, as the four powerful Force users quickly clashed against each other. Anakin and Quinlan finally reunited, fought with each other on a level that surprised the Sith. They'd been working together for over a decade now. They knew each other extremely well, and being reunited gave them even more strength. The air crackled with the conflicting energies of the Force, and the industrial surroundings provided a stark contrast to the lightsabers clashing within the lair. Count Dooku, a master duelist, engaged Anakin with perfect strikes, while Sidious toyed with Quinlan's defenses. Lightsabers clashed, sparks flew, as the combatants weaved through the chambers. Anakin would tap into the depths of his power as the Chosen One, channeling the energy of the Force to counter Dooku's calculated attacks. Dooku was trying to taunt Anakin with the dark side, but today it was not working. Quinlan was drawing on his mastery of both the light and the dark side, matching well with Sidious. One thing they did not expect from Quinlan was that having power over both sides of the Force made him extremely powerful now. Dooku again tried to taunt Anakin, but Anakin was not listening. The two had fought many times, and every time Anakin got closer and closer to beating him. And today, he finally did it. Anakin cut through Dooku's hands, kicking him to the wall. He grabbed Dooku's red lightsaber and flipped into the battle with Sidious and Quinlan. Sidious was then pushed all the way back to the open hangar door, and Quinlan grabbed Anakin with the force, using a huge force push to send Anakin flying at the Sith Lord. This caught Sidious off guard, and Anakin used both sabers to slice through him, telling Palpatine that his overconfidence was his weakness, as he fell in three pieces to the floor. From here, Dooku would be arrested and brought to the Senate. Quinlan and Anakin would bring proof of Palpatine's involvement, and with the Jedi Council in attendance, everyone would learn the truth. The Clone Wars would come to a swift end over the next few weeks, with the Separatists losing their two main leaders, and eventually the Separatist Senate would surrender. Grievous would be destroyed, and the rebuilding Republic would emerge victorious. The Jedi Council would thank Quinlan and Anakin, and would even make Anakin a Jedi Master. Though they still made him remember his mistakes on Sereno, it is something that could not be forgotten, but it is something now that they all knew made Anakin stronger. Him and Quinlan would soon go back to the underworld of Coruscant and resume their roles, helping out the people who need it for years to come. Both of them would also begin secret romances, with Quinlan falling in love with Asajj Ventress and Anakin falling in love with Padme Amidala. It could cause problems in the future, but for now, both were happy in their roles, protecting the people. And folks, that is where our story ends today. Definitely one of the longer ones I've done in quite a while. 
but that's because it was one of the ones I enjoyed the most in quite a while. I took inspiration from a lot of things here. First, I mean, most of it was inspiration on Quinlan kind of falling to the dark. It was inspo from the Dark Disciple novel, where Quinlan actually teams up with Ventress. Some inspiration from the Lord Momin mask in the Vader comics. I wanted Quinlan to kind of have a way to quickly rejoin Anakin and a mask, you know, that sends him to the dark side did that well. And then Revan as well, just Revan turning to the dark because he kind of had his mind um, brainwashed and just turned to the dark side. I took inspiration from all three of those things to turn Quinlan. Otherwise, I really liked this with Anakin kind of embracing the role of being able to kind of go on missions right away with Quinlan rather than being stuck in the temple. And I like the idea of Anakin being more comfortable in the Coruscant underworld because he grew up in a world of crime and villainy rather than the beautiful temple, right? So I liked exploring those ideas for sure. And yeah, let me know what you thought. Maybe I could have included Padme more, but overall, I really do like this story. So thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the next video.